keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verse 16. Matthew chapter 11, verse 16. <coughs> Now here is where we begin the condemnation of the Jews. This is where our Lord Jesus Christ realizes, he always knew of course, but uh, right now they have rejected the message. The Jews have. Most of them, some of them accepted it. Most of the Jews said, no, nah, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're the Son of God. And since they made that decision from their negative volition, our Lord is about to condemn them. You can also call, call this a study of uh, Jesus gets tougher. He gets tougher with these people, a lot tougher, because they rejected him. And now he's going to make sure that no one can be shocked toward the gospel. What, what I mean is he's going to try to shock them into believing in him. But, uh, and for some of them it will work, but uh, for most it will not. And so he begins to... Immediately, well, he kind of makes it personal and looks at them straight in the eye and tells them what they are. And he says in 11.16, To what will I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in markets who complain to their friends. We played the flute for you, yet you did not dance. We have mourned, and yet you did not lament. Superficial people who don't have the spiritual life demand superficiality in others. Superficiality is often passed as sincerity. And a lot of the religious people knew how to go through certain actions in which they would look sincere. Someone would die and they would look as if they mourned. Someone would have a party and, well, when the flute was played, they would dance. Whatever society said was right, that's what they would follow. They would follow tradition. They would follow the superficiality of tradition. And so superficial people always demand superficiality in others. And even though behind your back they will chew you apart and rip you apart, to your face they'll be very superficial and have a smile. But behind that smile are wolves' teeth, and they want to rip you apart. Now, I'm not talking to any of you specifically. I'm just telling you what Jesus was saying to the religious crowd. They were religious. And on the outside, they were as whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they were very sweet to most people until someone crossed them like the Lord. And when the Lord showed them grace, they showed their re real teeth, the teeth of wolves. We played the flute for you, yet you did not dance. We have mourned, and yet you did not lament. The point concerning this is that these people, these Jews who have rejected our Lord, are never pleased. They're never satisfied with the communicator of doctrine. Doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter which personality it is. They're not satisfied with it. And we'll see this in a moment when he talks about John and he talks about himself. Two different communicators of doctrine. One, Jesus Christ. The other, John the baptizer. Both had different personalities. Jesus Christ came into the world eating and drinking wine. John the Baptist came into the world eating a locust and honey and never drinking wine. Yet they criticized them both. So the point still is it's the message, not the man. And that's the whole point through all of these verses we've been studying pretty much. 11.29 Take my yoke on you and learn for, from me. Now this isn't from the, uh, for the unbeliever. The unbeliever cannot take his, the yoke of Christ. Impossible. 
This is for believers only. Take my yoke and learn from me. He lived the prototype. We live the protocol. When we live the protocol, we are taking the yoke of Christ. And remember, if you aren't familiar with a prototype and protocol, remember, uh, it's like uh, the government enlists you to create a plane. So you create a prototype. That's what our Lord did, created the prototype. He had eight problem-solving devices. He had all the spiritual skills we have, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. He, in, well, our God the Father invented it, and he test-piloted it. It's as if our Lord was a test pilot. He flew the plane, found out it would work under any circumstance. Even when ice starts to get on these wings, the plane still flies. Normally, ice gets on a wing, even just a small coat of ice on the wings will disrupt the flow of air and the plane uh, falls like a rock. But uh, the Lord flew it and no matter what occurred, the plane still flew. And w he gave it to us and said, yes, I'm the test pilot. It works under any circumstance. It's your turn to fly it. And so when we take on the yoke, we are using the protocol spiritual life. We are using the uh, two power options, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and Operation Z, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics, and for us, ten problem-solving devices. Two are added, rebound, our Lord never had to rebound, and occupation with Christ, our Lord never had to be occupied with himself. So take my yoke on you and learn from me. Live the unique spiritual life, because I am meek. This meek doesn't refer, uh, and this is almost funny the way it comes out in the English. We've been seeing how Christ has ripped apart his own students, his own disciples. Now he's really about to rip apart the religious crowd, and he's going to shock them. And he says, because I am meek. Well, this meek, the word meek, doesn't mean what you usually think. Meek people get run over all the time. If I were to stand up here and be meek and teach grace, I would already be out the door. People would have pushed me out because I would have been meek, no authority. But that's not what it means. Meek means he's living his prototype spiritual life. He has subordinated himself. Look, he's the son of God. He has deity and he has humanity. And he humbled himself so much that he would not use his deity in any circumstance. And we studied how he did not use his deity when he was tempted by Satan. And he didn't turn Satan into a gingerbread man, even though he could. And he didn't turn the stones into bread, even though it would have been very easy for him and his deity. He used his humanity. And in his humanity, he lived a spiritual life, the same one we have. And it's something we have to sit down and think about uh, for a moment uh, on our own and by ourselves. And we have to think about it and we have to say, uh, we have the same spiritual life our Lord had. And we have to, I can't even uh, put it to you in words enough to describe the phenomenal assets all of us have. I can't even describe it. It's indescribable. The only thing I can do, you see, this is one of these passages where you have to preach and not just teach. Because uh, something, words uh, almost don't even describe uh, what's happening here. And he's saying, I am meek, living his prototype spiritual life. And lowly. That is lowly in his mind, lowly in the frontal lobe. This is humility plus grace orientation. Our Lord, the Son of God, had humility, extraordinarily humility. And he humbled himself to the point of going to the cross. There's no humility like this. And yet all the religious people would look at the Lord and say, that man there is arrogant. Why would they have a tendency to say that? Because he just chewed them out. He's just insulted him, insulted all these religious people in 11.16 and 11.17. Now, I know I just skipped all the way to 11.29, and I had my papers confused. But I'll preach it again when we get there. It must be something we need to hear twice. 11.18. Now, this is where we need to be going. I was wondering why people got shocked looks. I didn't know if it was me or the fact I had just uh, screwed up. I screwed up. It happens. I'm human. Now, 11.18. In 11.18, you see, I laid this out before class thinking I would understand what I was doing, and then I forgot. 11.18, for John came neither eating. This is a good passage, too. For John came neither eating. That is 
He did not eat food that would offend the religious crowd. They had a lot of rules, you see, just as a lot of churches around here have rules that aren't even part of Scripture. You go to churches around here, don't smoke, don't chew tobacco, don't even have a glass of wine, don't do this, don't do that. All these rules that aren't even part of Scripture. But John, John the baptizer came neither eating, that means he never ate food that would offend the religious crowd, the legalists. He never did anything that would offend the legalist. Never. For John came neither eating food nor drinking. This drinking doesn't mean just drinking. You see, if he had came not drinking, you see, if it had meant not, he would have died. We have to drink water, right? So what's this a reference to? John the Baptist drank. He drank water. He didn't drink wine is what it's saying. I mean, and, and for people to think that, their stupidity, really, not stupidity, it's ignorance and legalism and religion. And religion clouds the thinking. So they say, for John came neither eating nor drinking. Now, and if you took that literal, you would say, the man never ate or drank. He should have died. Well, he ate food that wouldn't offend the legalist is what it means. And he drank water which wouldn't offend the legalist or the religious crowd. And what do they say? He has a demon. Well, he never touched wine. And he never ate pork. And he never ate ham. He ate honey and locust. And so they could never accuse him of being a glutton because he ate very light, honey and locust. And they could never accuse him of being a drunkard because he didn't drink alcohol, never did. So John came neither eating nor drinking wine and they say, he has a demon. So guess what? It's not about the man, is it? Or what the man does. The man could have come eating and drinking wine, and they would have said, he has a demon. Or the man could have came uh, following all the rules of the taboos. You see, it used to be a taboo not even to chew gum. Chewing gum was a big taboo a long time ago in the past. That's faded now, but it used to be. And if you didn't follow those taboos, you were ostracized and criticized. Well, John the Baptist followed the taboos, not because he had to. It was just his uh, personality. He had a different one than our Lord. Yet he communicated grace. What do we see from this? It doesn't matter what the communicator of doctrine does. What matters is what he has to say. Because if you always focus on the communicator and say, ooh, he's a sinner. Oh, b really? Well, you've just made a, a tremendous revelation. He's a sinner. So are you. So is everyone around you. He's a sinner, just this and that. Well, you gossip. You're a sinner. Not you in particular. I don't know if you do or don't. I don't care. It's none of my business. That's between you and the Lord. But I say you in general, as in all around Anderson, people gossip. And that's a sin, too. And then, well, they see John, and they say he has a demon. Yet he never did anything offensive. And so uh, don't ever, ever go up to someone and say, you know, if you wouldn't do this, people might accept you better. No, it's not true. Right here from Scripture, it's not true. No matter what you do, if people reject grace, no matter how the communicator acts, no matter how he behaves, if he still teaches grace, he's going to be attacked. Now, if he changed his message, the attacks would stop, and the church would fill up. So uh, don't uh, use it as an excuse. What you really want to say is change your message. Now, you can do what you want on the site. Change your message to where I like it. And that's the way most people function, and I'm not talking specifically to you people here. There's been people who have uh, criticized me outside of these walls, and I'm not... Uh, and it doesn't really bother me. They're the ones receiving the discipline, not me. I get blessed every time it occurs. Then in 11:19, it says this. The Son of Man, that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, perfection. Perfection came. The Son of Man came eating. That was he ate stuff that the religious crowd would say, oh, he can't be the Savior. The Savior, the Messiah, would never eat something like that. You see, uh, there were a lot of uh, health food nuts back then. There are today, but it was really rampant back then. 
and it, it came from an extension of the Mosaic Law. In the Mosaic Law, they had an, a, a code for eating, and you couldn't eat pork, and you, they, there's a whole listing in, um, in Deuteronomy and other places in the Old Testament, Leviticus, uh, where they would uh, give a listing of what you could eat and what you could not eat. And it was part of a health code for the country. And we have health codes. We have stuff like the FDA, and they regulate medicines, and they don't want you to take certain medicines. It might harm the uh, community and the culture if they take certain medicines, so they test all of these things. And the same held true then. It was just different. Don't eat the pig. The pig is defiled, and that's the way it was then. It's not that way now. The laws changed after uh, at, uh, it, they were shortly going to change very soon, but at this point they were still in effect. So the Son of Man came eating, and they would see, now he never ate anything outside of the Mosaic Law, but they would see him eating something that was a taboo. They made up taboos. Well, you can't eat that and be the Son of God. And drinking! Well, of course he drank, but uh, the reason why he mentions it is uh, our Lord drank wine. Everybody in those days uh, pretty much drank wine. You see, uh, good water was not... Uh, readily found. They drank water too, uh, but uh, for their main course of meal at dinner time, what they drink with it? Wine. And so our Lord too, at the main course of the meal, he would drink wine. Never got drunk. Such a thought would be blasphemy, but that's what they thought. Just because he drank wine, they said, oh, this man's getting drunk. No, he drank wine and did not get drunk. The Son of Man came eating and drinking wine, and they say, look at him! Look at him! You see, they just said John the Baptizer has a demon. Now, uh, either way, no matter what you do, they're going to attack is the point. You can't change your lifestyle, and you can't change for these religious people. They will attack grace wherever they see it, whether you are living by their standards or not. John the baptizer lived by their standards, never drank wine, never was a glutton. The Son of Man came eating and drinking wine, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and prostitutes. They had their eye on the man. They weren't listening to what the Lord had to say. They had their eye on what he did, what our Lord did. Now, don't say this out loud. Just think to yourself. What would you think of me if I uh, walked down the street and started hanging out with prostitutes? I probably wouldn't be here much longer. And they would say, that weirdo, and I probably would be if it really happened that way, but I'm making an example. That weirder, weirdo walks down West Whitner and uh, talks to prostitutes. What's he up to? He must be wanting to uh, have sex with prostitutes. He can't be the Son of God and do that, and I'm making an example for Jesus Christ not for myself, uh, but that's exactly how they did it. And just imagine if Jesus Christ were to come to the, let's say Jesus did not come back then, and let's say it did not happen, but for uh, an analogy to bring it home. Let's say our Lord Jesus Christ presented himself in a feeding trough in Anderson at some barn somewhere. And let's say he grew up around Anderson and uh, he was known to uh, go to a bar and have a glass of wine and talk with the prostitutes. And he was giving them the gospel. And let's say, well, a tax collector, that's going to be a hard one because uh, everybody hated the tax collector. It's not that he was uh, that bad of a sinner. He was just a symbol of authority over them collecting taxes, so they hated the tax collector. I can't think of anything offhand, but uh, just think of someone you hate, and that's who Jesus Christ would be hanging around. Tax collectors and prostitutes, visiting bars where they are, and uh, drinking a, a social glass of wine with them, and it's giving them the gospel, saying, I am the Son of God. What would most churches around here do? The same thing they did back then, and that's the point. Our country is in trouble, and that's the point. Our country is filled with believers who do nothing but judge. Now, don't take it personal. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those, uh, most people who go to churches around here. Their modus operandi is to gossip and judge and malign. And that's what they would do with our Lord. And you see, what would happen is 
all these great crowds of people would start to follow our Lord and what would the pastors around here do? Get jealous? Say, why does he have all these people? And then they would run up to his congregation and say, uh, this man, he hangs out with prostitutes and all. Are you sure you want to be associated with this man? Look what he does. They focused on the man. They didn't focus on the message. And our Lord was sinless, yet they had accumulated so many taboos that, and they were so full of themselves and thought of themselves as so perfect, they never could come around to seeing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah, the King. Then in 1120, then Jesus, you see uh, what happened here, is Jesus saw their negative volition. He saw that they, well, what they're about to do is try to put their thumb on him, try to shut him up. Uh, you can't talk to me that way. He just insulted them earlier, and so they're thinking to themselves, this man, who does he think he is? He says he's the Son of God. Look at what he does. He can't be the Son of God. I am going to destroy this man, and uh, I will put so much pressure on this man, he's going to change. And that's what they thought they could do. But when they got so obstinate, what did our Lord do? Well, he got rougher. He didn't back down. He wasn't intimidated. Now he gets rougher here, and then he leaves. He gets rougher, and then they say, I'm going to kill you, and then he says, all right, time to go. Not because he was scared. Definitely not. He's the Lord. He just knew well, they're negative. I'll go on somewhere else. So then Jesus began to castigate the towns and cities in which he had done many of his miracles. They had seen all these miracles, yet they still said he had a demon. They saw John the baptizer and said, you have a demon, because he was teaching the truth. And they saw Jesus Christ and said, you have a demon, because he was teaching the truth. And what he's saying is, you people aren't satisfied. Somebody comes along teaching the truth, no matter what their lifestyle, you're not satisfied. John the baptizer comes along and he's very moral in your eyes and you still say he has a demon. I come along and you call me a glutton, a, a person who sleeps with prostitutes and a drunkard and you say I have demons. He's, he's, what he's saying is you're never satisfied, people. I'm giving you the truth and you can't be satisfied with the truth, so you're negative. And he made that judgment right then. So he began to casticate the towns and cities in which he had done many of his miracles because they did not change their thinking about Christ. And I don't know what your uh, translation says. I didn't get a chance to look at it today. Uh, but uh, it probably says something about because they did not repent. That's what I'm guessing it says. Well, it means to change your mind. And as I told you before, the NIV in some places, when it gets to Esau, and this is funny, when it gets to Esau, the NIV says, Esau wept, but uh, he could not come to a change of mind. You know why they did it different there? Because it lines up with what they want to say. If they would have said, Esau wept, yet he could not come to repentance, well, people would have started scratching their heads. And they would have said, what do you mean he wept? I thought that was repentance. See? So the translator got a hold of it and was pretty smart and conniving and didn't want the real truth to get out. So he looked at it and said, yeah, he wept. But I'm not going to translate this repentance because uh, repentance means you weep for your sins. So I'll translate it, change your mind. And then in another place, the same word, metaneo, comes up and they say repentance. So your English Bibles are fallible. And when you look at it and say, I don't see that there, what you're saying. Of course you don't. There, these, the people who translated it are fallible. Some of the people who translated it were just like these religious people. And they get a hold of it and they see something that shocks them and they say, oh, I'm not translating it that way. No way. That steps on my toes. Let me change it. And they did. Because there hasn't been... A, much grace taught since the Apostle Paul until recently. And so they have a tendency to do that. The translations are getting better, though, as I've seen and read. But what it's saying here is change your thinking about Christ. Because you didn't change your thinking about me, even though they saw all these miracles, they still didn't change their thinking about me. So what is he about to do? He's about to chew them out. 
and you won't understand it until I uh, give it to you uh, in the light of history. Because he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Had the miracles among you been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have changed their mental attitude, that is, toward Christ, repentance. That's what repentance means. Changed their mind about Christ long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What does this mean? Now, it has no, really no meaning for us because we say, what is Tyre and what is Sidon? And woe to you, Chorazin. Well, that's where he's been teaching them the gospel and some doctrine. Woe to you, Bethsaida. That's where he revealed the gospel. Had the miracles done among you been done in Tyre and Sidon? This, these are two infamous, 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 these are two very evil places. I feel like, what's that guy who always stutters? The, the cartoon character. He tries Porky Pig. I look like Porky Pig, sound like Porky Pig. Two infinite, two wicked Phoenician cities. They would have changed their mental attitude long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Well, Tyre and Sidon are wicked cities, and that's our Lord's point. And we would have to understand and recognize that, well, it would be like uh, our Lord here today saying, if the people of New York City had heard this, if the people of New Orleans had heard this, they would have changed their minds in sackcloth and ashes. But uh, those cities really aren't that evil. If you wanted to bring it down, you would say, uh, the people of Paris... The people of Moscow, those are really evil, even more evil, but you won't understand that. So let's keep going. We have what has been done in Tyre and Sidon, wicked cities. And they always thought of themselves as being higher and greater than all the Gentiles. And what he's saying is, look, if I had done these things in front of the Gentiles, they would have believed, and you didn't. It's a curse on you. They would have changed their attitude toward Christ long ago in sackcloth and ashes. This has to do with the old customs back then. And remember Job when he was going through such a hard time, what did he do? Shaved his head, put ashes all over his body, and put on a sackcloth. It was part of the culture and, and part of something that uh, we're not going to study right now. But it, it just meant that they would change their mind. 11.22, but I tell you, it was less frustrating for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than it will be for you. This has to deal with eternal punishment. And he's saying, look, you people, you're going to hell. And they, the Tyre and Sidon, uh, received uh, temporal punishment. You are going to receive punishment forever and ever for not believing in me. And it's worse than what occurred with Tyre and Sidon. So he's insulting them. And we can't see it uh, because we weren't involved in that culture. But what he's saying is, you think of yourself as so holy, you're no better than a Gentile. And in fact, you're worse than those Gentiles. Worse than them. Because I showed you all these miracles and you did not believe. If I would have showed those miracles to those Gentiles, they would have believed. You're worse than these people. Insulting. Very, very insulting. I mean... For a Jew to be compared to a Gentile is one of the worst insults you could give to a Jew at that time. They had a racial superiority about them. They thought they were racially superior, but they weren't. It all has to do with volition. And nobody is racially superior to another person. We all have volition. We can say yes to the gospel or no, no matter what the color of our skin and everyone who says yes to the gospel is royal family of God, no matter what their race. Yet they thought, we are superior. We are Jews. We are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's the way they would think of themselves, and yet uh, they were nothing. And they were going to hell just like the Gentiles. This was shocking. And you have to bring it... It's hard for you to see it as shocking, but it is shocking if you were to uh, just... Uh, try to uh, put yourself in their shoes, as it were. Very shocking. And then he goes on. He's not finished with these religious nuts. And you, Capernaum, you won't be lifted up to heaven, will you? 
You see, they thought they were so moral and they followed the Mosaic law so much that they're going straight to heaven. And so he says, uh, you're, not going, you're not going to be lifted up to heaven, will you? Looking at them, looking at them in the face, being tough with them. And then he says, no, you will be brought down to Hades. Now, this is another way of saying, no, you're going to hell. And that's what he told them. Religious people, people who thought they were so good their whole life that they were the only people on the planet who would ever go to heaven. No one else was worthy except for them. Because brother so-and-so does this and brother so-and-so does that. I never do that. I thank God that I don't do the things brother so-and-so does. I thank God. This is what they said to themselves. I thank God I don't do what Jesus Christ does and drink wine and hang out with prostitutes. And they were talking about the perfect Lord Jesus Christ. And that was their attitude. So when he insults them, you can imagine they are going to really, well, the uh, uh, proverbially uh, saying, the uh, S is going to hit the fan. And you, Capernaum, you won't be lifted up to heaven, will you? No, you'll be brought down to Hades. For if the miracles done, done among you had been done in Sodom, it would have continued to this day. They all remembered the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as Jews. They had all learned that as children. And they knew that homosexuality was wrong, and it is. And they knew that the judgment for their, the unbelievers uh, committing homosexual acts they knew that the judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah was destruction because of their homosexuality. They knew that story very well. And so when our Lord compares them, actually says you're worse than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, imagine the shock. They had been raised as being the most holy people on the face of the earth. And they said, my fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I believe in the Mosaic law. I follow the Mosaic law. I'm great. I'm going to heaven. And then when the Lord comes along and sees them, he says, no, you're going to hell. And I tell you the truth, if the miracles that I've been showing to you had occurred in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have believed. And you don't. You're worse than those people. And then he keeps going, doesn't even let up on them. And you can imagine, they are seething with rage, seething with rage. But does our Lord care? Is he intimidated? No. He, in fact, he did it because he thought and he knew that a few of those religious people would be shocked. And they would be shocked into believing in him. Because while all the others were arrogant and said, no one talks to me that way, some of the ones who were positive said, let me think about this. Or they would have got scared, you see, and start to tremble. Maybe he's right. Maybe I, am, maybe I am worse than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe I do need a savior. So some believed, very few did. Most rejected it. But he had to be tough to make it clear, to pave the... To, to make it so clear that uh, there would be no question about it. And when those who rejected Christ get up to the last judgment, our Lord will be there and he'll be able to say this, I was down there and I gave you the gospel and you rejected it. No excuse for you. Bye-bye. To hell you go. Like I told you. I said you were going to Hades. Now you're going to the lake of fire just as I told you. At that time, well, but I tell you, this is what he says next, but I tell you in 1124, it was more tolerable for the region of Sodom on their day of judgment than it will be for you. This doesn't mean eternal judgment. This is temporal judgment. It's more tolerable to go under, the, uh, to go under collective divine discipline than it is to go under eternal judgment. That's obvious. So what he's saying is, uh, yeah, they were destroyed. Sodom and Gomorrah right now rest under the Dead Sea, and all those people are dead. But that temporal judgment is a lot less than having eternal, eternity in the lake of fire. Now it's true that uh, those in Sodom and Gomorrah did not believe. They too will be going there. But he's making a comparison and contrast saying, look, you've always learned about the temporal judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. You always heard about how Sodom and Gomorrah 
fell under the, um, the, uh, the great earthquake and the lava and everything else that spewed out and burned those people alive and they all turned to ash and sand and all of that and salt and those things. And so he says, what he's saying is you've heard about these things but you haven't believed in me so your eternal judgment is far worse than what they received in their temporal judgment. What he's doing is comparing and contrasting and he's insulting them very much. And he's saying, you think you're better than the homosexuals of Sodom and Gomorrah? You're worse than them. And you're going to hell. Shocking for them, because homosexuality for them would be one of the uh, worst sins. And by the way, it's not one of the worst sins. Oh, it's definitely a sin. It's definitely, definitely an abomination, as taught in Romans, but it's not one of the worst sins. Not even listed in the seven worst sins. What is? Gossip, maligning, and judging. What were these people doing? Gossip, maligning, and judging all the time. They thought nothing of it. And they would gossip about our Lord, judge our Lord, judge a perfect man, and think they were going to get away with it because they'd done it all their lives. They didn't know any better. But you know why some people don't know any better? Because they don't want to know any better. They finally heard it, and they didn't want it. 11.25. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the smart, that is the rationally smart, that is uh, like the Greek people who might have been listening. They were really into rationalism and all of that. You have hidden these things from the smart. Now you have to understand he's still being insulting because all the religious people think they sit there and they say, I'm smart. And they may have, many of them may have very well been very smart. Many of them had memorized the Old Testament from front to back and knew it and can quote it all over the place. But it d had no value for them. But they thought they were great because they were smart and could do something like that. Yeah, well, that's energy of the flesh. Hidden these things from the smart and the prudent, that is the empirically uh, prudent, empirically prudent. That is, the, you see, there is empiricism, and that's a form, and then there's rationalism, and that's a form. What is our system of learning? Faith. Faith is our system of learning. Now, a scientist must go by empiricism and rationalism. That's normal. But there's, there's one thing that uh, some scientists leave out, not all of them. If you were to talk to most scientists, they would say, well, for sure, there's a God. But the ones that get recognition are the ones who say there's not. And that's what they teach in schools today. And while your children are getting their homework, I would suggest, and as a suggestion, look over some of that stuff sometimes and make sure they're not being led astray by a bunch of liberals. And if, the, if you come across it, make sure you let them know, hey, you know this is wrong, don't you? And they'll probably say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. And then you'll say, well, all right, keep going with your homework. But guess what? Uh, the, the school system is a place of a lot of satanic influence today. No, now, high school, it's, it, it's not as bad as when you go to college. When you go to college, it's rampant. I know it is. I was there. They inculcate you the day you walk on campus. Do you want to join this homosexual group over here? It's okay to be homosexual. Join this gro group. Over here we have anti-war protests. Please join the anti-war protests. Let your voice be known. Immediately, immediately start to inculcate them. And it works for a lot of them. Until they get out of college and get back in the real world and then they uh, realize that they've uh, lost something just as I did and I got to put it back on and they realize that they have uh, well that all that stuff was nonsense especially when they start paying taxes <laughs> you say well tax the rich what do you mean they think I'm rich they're taxing me to death and so uh, what why I got off on that I don't know but uh, uh, what I'm telling you is uh, homework's important the word of God is more important always is more important Nothing is more important than the Word of God. And I don't care what type of criticism I get for getting up in your face and telling you that the Word of God is the most important thing on the planet. Because it is. And I won't back down from that. 
Never. It's my job. And I'm not going to stop my job. I'm going to keep going because it is important. And if people don't wake up to the importance of the word of God, our country will go under and homework will be meaningless. And I'm not saying you told your children to do homework. It's more important. I'm not saying that at all. I don't know that. I'm making a principle. There are things more important than the little details of life. And that's a little detail. Oh, it's important. You should do your homework when your teachers do it, but it's one hour in a day. One. And the only hope for this country is a teenage type of uh, revival. Because uh, most of the people who were concerned about the Word of God are passing on now. And we need younger people to get with it. And they don't need to be, they need to do what they need to do in terms of school and all that. But the Word of God is more important, and they need to get with that. And, they, and uh, they'll fail without it. It's that simple. Anyone will fail without doctrine. If I had a child, what would be, now I'm not uh, talking about any of you. Some of you might have this attitude, and they might not. But what, what, if I had a child, my attitude would be I would be much more grateful that they were interested in the Word of God than in algebra. But they should do their algebra, and I'd make them do it. But I would always make it clear as a leadership and say, do you know what they did in the Old Testament with their children in Israel? They would hang verses all over their homes. That is, if they loved the Word of God. They would hang it all over. And you see, when they would get up in the morning and go to whatever was comparable to their mirror, their washing hole, or whatever, there would be a verse right there on the tub or wherever they were going. And they memorized those things. And it stuck with them all the way through their youth because they would remember those things. Then they would go out into the world and get sucked up in the details of life. And then when things would get hard, they would start to recall these things and come back to it. And that's exactly what happened with Solomon. Now, I was going to make an announcement today that uh, on September 1st, I believe it's a Thursday, I'm going to start teen classes. And if some people don't show up, it doesn't matter because the teen classes that I put up, the four on the Internet, have gotten more hits than any of them, even the first one. And the first one got a lot of hits. And the, the first one usually was the one that got the most. But then the, now the teen classes have surpassed that. And there's an interest in it. And I get emails that say, hey, when are you going to start doing some more teen classes? Well, either way, I'm going to do it. I would have to do it here anyway, so I might as well make it at uh, 8.15 to 9. It'll be 45 minutes. And they don't have to come to the first. They don't even have to come to the second, but I'm going to give it September 1st on a Thursday. I picked September 1st because all of the things I'm doing with my house should be settled. I'll have a lot more time for study and I'll be able to throw in these two messages very easily. And I'll do the adult class, and adults are welcome to come too because it's going to be basic. Of course you're welcome to come and be with your children and make sure uh, they're getting something you want them to get. Otherwise, if you didn't want them to get it, we'll tell them uh, no good. Uh, but uh, this is going to happen because uh, young people need to get with it, and it's important for them to understand the impact they can have and it's the only, we need a revival among young people. And I might not be the leader of this revival among young people, but there needs to be one, and I'm going to do my job. There needs to be young people who get interested in the Word of God and make it number one. I did it as a teenager, and if I did it with all my problems, anybody can do it. It's all a matter of volition, but I'm going to make sure it's available. And I'm not going to chew them out if they don't show up because they're busy, even though they might need it. I won't do it. It's an optional type thing. And we'll have regular class at the 7 to 8, and then 8.15 to 9 will be teen. And you can hang around or you can go home. And it, 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 no skin off my back, and it, it won't be a, a point of being chewed out because, of course, uh, two hours might be a bit much for some people because you do have lives. I understand that. So that is what's going to happen on September 1st, just to let you know, and if you want to let them know, so that uh, be prepared for it. It's going to happen, and the door will be open. Probably that door down there. Uh, the church will be down there, probably this Sunday. It looks like it's going to be ready pretty soon. And it's uh, going to have a lot more space, and it's going to be a lot nicer. 
So, and it, it's pretty neat. So, uh, now we're going on to uh, 1127. And all things have been given to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son decides, that's based on positive volition at God consciousness, to reveal him. What this is saying is there's no way into heaven except by faith alone in Christ alone. If you know God the Son, you know God the Father. If you don't know God the Son, you don't know God the Father. And all of these religious people uh, thought they knew God the Father. And they thought they were like this with God the Father. And they weren't even saved. They were unregenerate. They were all destined for hell. So he makes it very clear. This is the, one of the few times that Matthew is actually giving the gospel or actually showing our Lord give the gospel. John shows the Lord give the gospel over and over again. Matthew had a different emphasis, and it was toward the Jew. And when Matthew saw those Jews getting ripped apart, he loved it because he was a tax collector. And that's why he was the personality who wrote Matthew because he saw Jesus rip them apart, and he, he, he remembered that stuff. He said, yeah, I remember that time. Those religious people were there and they were looking all holy. And remember the time the Lord looked at them and said, you're all going to hell. And he just started writing it down. He loved every minute of that. And at this time, he's uh, getting out the fact our Lord's about to give them the gospel. He's just ripped them apart first. He let them know they were sinners first. Now he's going to give them the gospel. And he says, all things have been given to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son decides, now he decides based on whether you're positive or not. It's not an arbitrary decision. And he doesn't go around saying, you're saved, you're not. One, stand up, you're saved. Two, stand up, you're not. And count off one, two, one, two. That's not how he did it. He decided based on if they believed in him, they're saved. That's the decision. He makes it, but he makes it clear that he makes the decision, not you. And he's making it clear that it's not, it is your decision in volition. But what he's making clear is that really you have no part of it. Because when you believe, first of all, you had to have common grace from God the Holy Spirit. And that means God the Holy Spirit made it perspicuous to you, understandable. So it was God the Holy Spirit who did it, not even you. So you understood it apart from yourself in spiritual death. And you can't go around bragging, I believed in Christ, I believed in Christ, and brag about it because uh, you did so because of something God the Holy Spirit did. And then you believe it. And guess what? You still wouldn't be saved unless God the Holy Spirit makes it, makes it effective. But he does and he makes it effective every time. So it's God always doing the work. And this is what he brings out by saying, whom the Son decides. It's God making the decision to use common and efficacious grace. It's God making the decision to save us when we believe. And we are saved when we believe. But it's God making the decision. It's apart from us. So it really shows us how helpless we are. And that's why he says this, to show us that we're helpless. And you don't work for salvation. And you don't work in your spiritual life. And we'll note all of this from Matthew. And he's teaching these religious people who think it's all about work and all about themselves. And when he points out to them, he's really... See, he's just made them mad, and now he's saying, you don't get to heaven apart from me. That's our Lord talking to them. And they had just called him a glutton and a drunkard. And now he says, you don't get to heaven apart from me. Oh, they are really boiling. They, because the, the whole time they're sitting there thinking, who does this man think he is? And then when he really looks in their face and says, apart from me, they really get fired up because he knows what they're thinking, and they get mad. Then in 11... Uh, 28 come to me I'm not going to talk about invite Christ into your heart you've already heard that enough even though you might need to hear it again come to me all you that is unbelievers who have worked yourself to exhaustion that is the corrected translation come to me all you who have worked yourself to exhaustion 
This isn't talking about physical labor. This is talking about they have worked themselves to exhaustion trying to get into heaven. They've worked themselves to exhaustion trying to follow all these taboos. They've worked themselves to exhaustion trying to follow all the religious nuts. So come to me, all you unbelievers who have worked yourself to exhaustion. That is, stop trying to save yourself. And under the heavy load, religion is always a heavy load, no matter what religion it is. If you're Islamic, it's a very heavy load. You've got to blow yourself up to go to uh, be with 70 virgins. Big deal. And then, if you're a Jew, you've got to follow all these laws and all these regulations. It's a heavy load. It's something that's impossible, really. And none of us can follow all those religious codes that are out there today. And Christianity is the only thing that says there is only one name under heaven by which man can be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. You believe in him and you're saved. And that is Christianity, and it's the only, only thing out there that says that. And it's not a religion. I won't say it's a religion. It's not. But it's the only faith out there that puts their faith in Jesus Christ. None other does it. Not one. And if you think about it and get those wheels turning in your brain, you'll say, you know, that's right. All the other religions work to go to heaven. In Christianity, Christ did all the work. So it becomes very obvious that uh, this is unique. Christianity is unique. And if you, as a Christian, try to incorporate works into it, you are trying to lower Christianity to the level of another religion. You are blaspheming. You are, well, you're doing what these religious people were trying to do. They were trying to get our Lord to lower himself to religion. And he said, no way, I'm not doing that. I'll insult you till the cows come home. I'm not doing that. And he didn't. 1129, now this is dealing with believers. 1128, unbeliever. Well, let me continue. And under the heavy load, that is, of religion, and I will give you rest. Rest is salvation, of course. You believe in Christ, you receive salvation. Finally, you can rest. You don't have to work for it anymore. Christ did it all. You can rest and know, and know when you lay your head down at night that you're saved. It's a wonderful feeling. There's a joy in knowing that you're saved. There's a curse in being saved and thinking you can lose it. Because when you lay your head down at night, you know you've committed some sins. And if you can lose it, well, then I would have trouble sleeping at night if I thought I could lose my salvation. I would feel guilty my whole living days. And that's not the way we are to live. We live under grace. And since we are saved and we can't lose it, not possible we can reverse what Christ did on the cross. We can lay our head down at night and rest and sleep well and know that if our souls are taken away in the middle of the night, they'll go straight to heaven to be with the Lord. No matter who and what we are, it doesn't matter who and what we are. It matters who and what Christ is. And it didn't matter that these religious people thought that they were so great. They were still destined for hell. And they probably laid their head on their pillows at night and said, oh, I'm going to heaven, I'm so great, and fell asleep. And if they would have died, they'd have went straight to hell because they never believed in Christ. They thought they were destined for heaven because of who and what they are, and they were nothing. They were puke. They were gross, gross people, just like all of us are before we're saved, depraved, without any type of ability to have salvation apart from the grace of God. So in 1129, it's talking to believers. Believers, take my yoke on you and learn from me. The yoke, of course, his yoke, the prototype. Take on the yoke, the protocol. He lived the prototype, we live the protocol. All of these things you should already remember from earlier studies. Because I am meek, that it doesn't mean he's meek. It means he's been living his prototype spiritual life. And lowly in the frontal lobe, that means he has humility and grace orientation. And you will find rest for your souls. This is faith rest. This is for the believer. First of all, there's a rest in salvation. And you realize you don't have to work your way into heaven. So you rest in that. 
Then, when you start to grow up spiritually, you find out that there's a rest in the spiritual life. And you rest in that. And you rest in the faith rest drill. And that's a concept that comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Make sure that you do not fall short of the faith rest drill is what it says. So you have to claim promises, and you have to mix them with faith, and you have to use the four stages of the faith rest drill, and you'll find rest from the spiritual life. So he's saying, what, it, what he's saying is, none of it's work. Salvation, it's not work, it's rest. What happens after salvation? The spiritual life. The spiritual life is not work, it's rest. You rest. Now, it might be hard to rest while I'm shouting, but then you can learn these things and go home and rest in them. And I have to shout, remember, teach and preach. Some days I'll preach more than others, and some days I'll teach more than preach. It just depends on what the Holy Spirit uh, grabs me and says to do. And so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, this is a wonderful privilege for us to study this portion of the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things, and may we come to understand grace better from this Matthew series. May we come to understand that salvation was given to us by you, and our spiritual life was given to us by you, and that we were saved by grace, and that we must live by grace. And may we never uh, come to the point of arrogance so that we can become a deliverance to our country and so that we can have a phenomenal impact. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.